Hello, Journeyers. I'm Tony Carnes, your host for this journey through New York City's religions. This morning, we have a conversation with Max McLean, an actor widely known for his rich voice in the podcast, Listener's Bible, and inspiring presentations of C.S. Lewis's books. The Wall Street Journal has called his stage presentation of C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters wickedly witty, a one hell of a show. The New York Times calls his current play, C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, infinitely thought-provoking, consistently intriguing. As an avid dramatic producer, Max McLean is also the founder of the Fellowship for the Performing Arts. This November will mark the debut of the full-length movie on the spiritual transformation of C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia Tales. Max wrote the dramatic play upon which the movie script is based and plays a mature C.S. Lewis looking back upon his journey to conversion to Christianity. Welcome to the show, Max. Thank you, Tony. Good to be with you. Max, I understand that New York City happens to be your residence. It is, yeah. Is it, is it your favorite city? Well, as you know, it's a wounded city now, uh, but at its peak, when it uh, does what it does, there's no city in the world like it. And yeah, so many th wonderful things have happened to you here before. I, I feel like putting on a play in New York City is very different from putting on a play any, any place else. Is that what you find? I think that's true. I mean, you know, here in New York, you have uh, world-class artists, world-class theater companies coming together, uh, producing the kind of world-class art uh, that gets uh, created here and and uh, gets exported around the country, around the world. And so being in New York really makes us step up our game. Now, C.S. Lewis is a a Christian apologist. He, he didn't start that way, of course. Uh, he started as a scholar with a very materialistic view and then through a series of dramatic moments and personalities that he met, he became a Christian. But today he's often known as an apology, apologist, a evangelist for the Christian faith. How is he received in New York uh, differently than other places in in the country and also in England where you took on? Well, surprisingly, uh, you know, the show ran in New York for 15 weeks, uh, a one person show about a, a religious conversion. Uh, I like conversion stories because once I was this, now I became that. It's about change. It's about a conflict that produces change. And uh, Lewis uh, uh, personifies uh, the kind of, of, religious conversation about uh, you know about spiritual life uh, that a lot of smart artistic well-read people uh, can uh, can relate to I know so, that yeah go ahead I'm sorry yeah so I, I do think that uh, uh, people that are interested in, in the topic. I mean, you know, in theater, people self-select what they're interested in. Some people just like, uh, you know, musicals, other people like comedies, but other people really want to have a, a, a serious conversation, uh, a, a well, a well-told story about a serious conversation that has to do with religion. Oh, that was my, uh, <laughs> uh, Siri just wanted to join our conversation. Um, uh, hello, Siri. We'll interview yeah. you next week. Yeah, uh, Siri has actually been uh, speaking up regularly in, in my conversations. Uh, so anyway, I do think that uh, that New York was a really good place to launch uh, Most Reluctant Convert. Yes, I, I, I recently had the experience of watching your new movie, The Most Reluctant Convert, The Untold Story of C.S. Lewis. I really like how you start with the behind the scenes preparations for shooting the movie, and then you exit through a private door to the reality of Lewis's life. Yeah. It's a wonderful introduction. Thank uh, you. 
and as you transform into Lewis, your alliterative, alliterative introduction uh, to his belief at that time that the universe was empty, that of any meaning, and that humans are destined to the gar cosmic garbage heap, is just stunningly beautiful and, of course, tragic at the same time. Well, that was Lewis's belief system. Of course, you know, he lost his mother to cancer. He had a terrible relationship with his father. Um, he was, uh, you know, in the trenches during the Great War, World War I, uh, which, uh, which he, he described as horribly smashed, seeing horribly smashed men that look like crushed beetles. Uh, and so his, his experience of suffering and evil uh, came, gave him the conclusion that either there's no God behind the universe, a God indifferent to good and evil, or worse, an evil God. Uh, and he couldn't come to terms with, uh, with the world being made by a wise and good creator because that wasn't his experience. Now I'm wondering, and I'm sure audiences will wonder that you're the playwright for the theatrical drama. Uh, you have all types of uh, activity in this movie, in, uh, both behind the scenes, but also as the narrator, the mature Lewis narrating reflection on his life. How deeply are you, at, you've, you've played a lot of Lewis's plays. How deeply are you attached to C.S. Lewis? Well, he's become my spiritual guide. Uh, you know, I was converted as an adult uh, in my 20s, and uh, so was Lewis. I think he was 32 when he finally committed to Jesus Christ. So he, he uh, probably committed to uh, real monotheism, you know, what he calls the God of the Jews. Uh, not that he was Jewish, but he understood that there was one personal God. I think he understood that. Uh, in the Trinity term 1929, I gave in and admitted that God is God, knelt and prayed, perhaps the most reluctant convert in all England. Uh, so, uh, so his experience as a, going from atheism and Christianity was, has always been uh, helpful to me. Uh, he always knew where the landmines were, and he always knew where the important questions were. Uh, you know, that God came from someplace else and entered into our created world and came out again, bringing us with him. And, he, you know, and he says, either you believe that, uh, or that's what the Christian believes, or uh, you believe that, you know, he was a lunatic on the level of a poached egg, he says, or uh -huh. he's telling lies from the devil of hell. And he says, if you, unless you believe that, and I can't, you turn to the Christian story. And, uh, and so, and then, of course, that opens the door. And then once he gets in the door, he, he finds this, this, uh, uh, this element of desire that if I find in myself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. Now, and, you, su you suggest that this desire maybe went all the way back to his childhood uh, in reflectively anyway for him yeah but that the toward the the this you covered his interaction with some famous uh personalities and you know, arguing about god and jesus and all of that but then you reflect back that he felt something unusually touching himself when his young brother as a kid brought him a model of a garden to look at. And he has comes in his hands, and he has this toy, you might say a toy garden. And it has some of a white flower and it, it's a beautiful. And it suggests that Lewis at that moment in childhood felt something different. Is that, that mm -hmm. what you're saying? And what did he feel there? Yeah, well, this these elements of a deep desire that no experience in this world could satisfy. Uh, he called that experience you talked about as by this uh, biscuit tin, moss and twigs and flower, yeah. to make a toy garden. He said it was the first beauty he'd ever known. Uh, 
uh, it, it was a feeling of enormous bliss and it was a sensation of desire. But before he knew what he desired, it was gone. And he called that joy. Mm -hmm. And he thought joy is, is not to be confused with happiness or pleasure, except uh, anyone who's ever tasted joy will want it again. He said, it's almost like grief, but the kind of grief we want. And, uh, and so that was kind of the pointer that there's something beyond this world. And of course, after Lewis's conversion, he said that uh, he didn't think that, that earthly pleasures were ever meant to satisfy this desire only to arouse it. And so thus he made it his duty to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. Now, that childhood experience uh, is probably something many children have. And I'm wondering, you have traveled thousands of miles uh, on stage. Uh, you've traveled also thousands of miles as a kid, uh, as an army brat. Mm -hmm. I wonder, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your journey of getting in the drama and also getting into Lewis's God world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I went into the theater first uh, and it was primarily to overcome my fear of public speaking. You went there, and now you were, this was at the University of Texas, am I that's right? That's right, that's right. You and I share an alma mater, don't we? That's right. That's why I had to bring it up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, probably roughly about the same time in yeah. the seventies. And uh, uh, it was there that you know I took an oral interpretation class at the, at the, the weird part of campus, the drama department, and that's where the bug bit. Uh, and so I, I started to uh, work on my voice, you know, my ability to mind, my ability to move to. Uh, interpret text. Those you say the bug you know, bit. I'm, I'm a little curious. What was that bug? I mean, when you went in, what was going on that you say, oh, well, I never really. Well, it's, about you know, I, I, I had what to... is known as, I had what is known as sociophobia, the fear of being in front of people. Hmm. Uh, and, and I was called out on it, you know, in, a, in an experience that was really very embarrassing. And so I needed to get out, uh, it was called on in class. And uh, so I figured I had to do something about this. And so I went to the weird part of campus and, and took an oral interpretation class. And, and I, was, I, I found out that you know, I could overcome this, this pathology, I suppose. And, uh, and really I had, you know, I had a desire to, to express myself vocally. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, I, you know, started to apply, read scripts and, and just really enjoy the, the theatrical vernacular, Shakespeare, uh, Bernard Shaw, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams. I mean, these guys were just writing stuff that really moved me. Uh, and then shortly, so I, my objective was to go to England to go to drama school, which I ended up doing, but in the process of going from America to England, I, I met the Lord. And, uh, and he, uh, uh, he sort of redirected, not, not initially, I, I think initially it was there, but uh, over time that, uh, that impulse was developed and ultimately became Fellowship for Performing Arts. Well, now you didn't grow up uh, religious, did you? Well, I had a nominally Catholic background, which when I recall uh, in my younger age, I, I, I really took it pretty seriously. I mean, I was, uh, I was compelled, you know, by catechism, by the stories of Jesus. Uh, I met some wonderful priests that uh, uh, really uh, believed and, and uh, were encouraging. But, you know, uh, by the time I was 14, I just put all that stuff behind me. You know, I had other things and left it behind uh, completely uh, and went through uh, an atheistic period and then uh, more of a new age period. Uh, and then I kind of, you know, hit bottom in the sense of, you know, spiritually, you know. Was this in, in like the going US forward. or in England? Uh, it was in between. Yeah, because uh, dad was stationed in Germany. Uh, you know, I mean, hitting bottom has all sorts of forms. You know, it, it's uh, in, in my case, it was just this malaise 
you know, of not, uh, of life not going anywhere or almost being rather listless uh, uh, or going from being super ambitious for the wrong things to being listless and kind of going back and forth. So uh, I, I think what Christ did was he sort of ordered my, my loves and ordered my, uh, uh, my objectives and realized that uh, I was loved and, and uh, that, that God had a purpose for me. Now, at that time, I, I, I don't think you really knew much about Lewis. He didn't play a role. Well, Lewis came shortly thereafter. Oh, really? I remember, I, I mean, somebody gave me a copy of Surprise by Joy. And, you know, because it was about his conversion story. This is, I was 23, just converted. I think the only, I, I had read uh, the New Testament. I'd read uh, the Brothers Karamazov, which, by the way, is probably the greatest Christian novel ever written. Uh, but that was really my uh, history. I think somebody tried to give me a John Stott book, which was a little too dry for me at that time. Uh, but then it gave me this Lewis book, mm. Surprised by Joy. And I read it. I read it from cover to cover. I think it went by me like a freight train. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> and so the, then that person said, well, try this one. So they gave me the screw tape letters. And I said, I know this guy. <laughs> this guy, oh, and know. when you play him, it seems like you inhabit him. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt that the the insight Lewis has about spiritual warfare from a demon perspective is so real, and and of course he's being so uh, so transparent, right? You know, he's talking about his own experience. Can you give us uh, a little screw tape this morning? Uh, uh, your affectionate uncle, screw tape. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it's a, fan, a fantastic portrayal that you have. Thank you, thank you. And I got to say, your portrayal of Lewis was um, when you go from behind the stage through the private door, and then you're out into, you know, the real world and playing Lewis. It actually sort of, it seems like you are Lewis. Well, I hope so. That's the objective. Uh, you know, you want to. Uh, you want to get under his skin and I feel like I know Lewis really well and and actually the most reluctant convert play then movie emerged as a result of doing screw tape and doing uh writing the adaptation of the great divorce because in both cases they reflect on his on his conversion in, in the sense of what were the impulses that were keeping keeping him away from Christ, mm -hmm. you know, in in Screw Tape, it's it's about uh, spiritual warfare uh, from a devil's point of view, tempting you away from doing what you ought to do, and in the Great Divorce, it's the opposite side of the coin where you're resisting the spirit. You know, the spirit's calling you, your your conscience is telling you what the right thing to do is, and you just keep suppressing it and say no 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 and and both both is both of those books are born out of lewis's own experience as he was wrestling with his own conversion i wonder as you've gone through his books which sounds like you sort of went in the order of that they touched you most personally have now you're doing C.S. Lewis's um, untold story, his life, in a new way. Have do you feel that your understanding of Lewis has grown since the first dramas that you did of Lewis up to today, and how has it grown? Well, in the sense of just a simple act of of taking a story from page to stage, you know. Uh, you, you really have to know it. You have to understand the movements of it. You have to understand what are the emotional intent? What is he driving at? Where's he trying to go? And, and so you, you really have to get underneath it. And, and then in order to embody it, you just uh, read a lot. I've, I've, I've read probably a dozen biographies of Lewis, uh, read most of his uh, books, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, and you get you you paint you get a picture of this huge personality you know smartest guy in the room uh, uh, and uh, 
and actually a pretty proud man who, who uh, judiciously and, uh, and, uh, and consciously attempted to live out the Christian faith. You know, he understood that Christianity makes demands on you and you have to repent, you have to change. And so he's always taking this sort of spiritual inventory. And, uh, and, and, you know, the challenge is that's hard on us. Uh, but Lewis is a really wonderful exemplar of what that looks like when you cross the Rubicon in terms of moving towards salvation, moving towards sanctification, uh, you know, that he became perhaps the most influential Christian writer of the 20th century uh, because he, he struggled with his faith in terms of the demands of his faith and not, you know, going into easy believism or, or a cheap grace, but really uh, yeah, pressing on toward to the goal to win the prize. Yeah, yeah you capture this, uh, this moment where he says, I'm smart, but I'm shallow and tinny. Yeah. And he starts talking to people like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, and also a scholar. What was Tolkien's role in the very, because Tolkien, that, those the conversation took very close just before Lewis converted. What was Tolkien? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Lewis is, uh, he couldn't, he didn't know what to make of Jesus Christ. He understood the idea of God. I'm talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he, uh, he said his religion was like that of the Jews in the sense of, of, uh, of monotheism. He was, he called, uh, he thought, uh, heaven was a bribe, uh, you know, he, he, he really, it was about if God exists, he is our creator and we're responsible to him. But he did not understand the role of Jesus. Uh, he, he, he asked Tolkien the question, you know, I don't understand how the life and death of someone else 2,000 years ago can help us here now. And Tolkien reminded him of something that would begun with the toy garden is as when you read a myth or when you read a story, uh, you know, Balder, uh, Osiris, uh, Dionysus, or even fairy tales, or, you know, you like them very much, they move you. And, and all of these stories are about dying and rising gods. You know, that's, that's the core story behind the story. And, uh, and he says, you like them very much. And says, uh, you like these stories of dying and rising gods when you meet them anywhere except in the Gospels. And then Tolkien made the, uh, the point that, that uh, the Jesus story is like the other stories with one, one uh, significant difference. It really happened. <laughs> I like and, how you put it. You, you, you transform it into dramatic terms yeah. you say something about well because lewis was saying uh, uh, wrestling with uh, uh, well if we're if we're if we're so separate from god and this is a materialist world how can we ever get to even know him meet him and you you use a uh, an, a metaphor of shakespeare yeah to meet hamlet could you talk about that i found that fascinating yeah that's uh, he said uh uh, when he believed in God, it was uh, his his first step towards belief was a was a kind of an idealism, you know, that uh, God was completely other. Um, but uh, you know that, and he found that to be very religious, actually, in terms of an experience. Uh, and and it it also came from the fact that he couldn't come to terms with with uh, consciousness, really. You know, is consciousness just a matter of atoms colliding in skulls, or is it something else? Because where does meaning come from? Where does purpose come from? Where where does uh, where does thought come from? And so this took him to 
well, there had to be a kind of a deistic first cause, you know, and he said, okay, I can live with that. And he says, that then he became kind of impressed by that. But he also said, but this is a God that, you know, there's nothing to obey, nothing to believe. He's out there. He'll never come here and make a nuisance of himself, <laughs> right? Which is a great line. And, uh, and then, uh, then he realized that, that uh, he had a conversation with T.J. Weldon, who was this athe uh, the, the, the hardest boiled atheist ever known, who said to him, you know, the, uh, the history of the Gospels are uh, run, you know, surprisingly good. <laughs> you know, uh, rum thing, all that mythology about dying gods, it looks like it really happened. It, and he was kind of stumped by that. He goes, whoa. So he started taking the, God, the, the Bible a little bit more seriously. And, and he came to the conclusion that uh, if Hamlet and Shakespeare could ever meet, it would have to be Shakespeare's doing. He could write himself into the play. And then so he, he, he basically said that's what God did. He wrote himself into the play. Well, you know, that, I think that's so interesting. And, and what you're doing on play right now is, is you're writing, you're trying to write God, C.S. Lewis, and the people's life through this movie. And it is a, a wonderfully shot, wonderfully filmed. The script is terrific. It's this snapping and energy. And your uh, portrayal of Lewis is nothing like but being next standing next to him i would think that anybody should just run to go see this movie now it's only going to be it's got sort of a small opening i know you're trying to build support in this pandemic time tell us a little bit about when it's opening and how can they get tickets yeah well uh it, it's uh you know we're a theater company we're not a movie company so you know we have to earn our stripes quickly and, yeah uh no uh, but november 3rd uh, we're at uh, we're we're nationwide. We're over 300 theaters nationwide. AMC, Regal. You can look it up at cs lewis movie.com. cs lewis movie.com. Uh, uh, one day only, November 3rd. Well, I think that uh, this is a, a great opportunity uh, uh, during this pandemic period to have some meaning in life and a joy. Thank you very much for being with us, Max, this morning, uh, this afternoon, and evening, whenever. We run this, and I'm Tony Carnes, your host for A Journey Through NYC Religions Television.